Okay, so welcome back everybody to interventional medical image processing. And um, yeah, you all know we have to switch to a written exam, so there won't be oral exams in this lecture term. But um, we so we used to say that the a very a very likelihood um, candidate for the first question in the oral exam is that you uh, actually have to dr uh, to draw the cloud. Yeah? So um, most likely we will not ask uh, something about the cloud in a written exam. But if you listen closely, um, you may hear that I'm emphasizing certain points when I'm drawing the cloud, which may have uh, significant relevance for the actual written exam. Yeah, just to make this clear. Yeah, I'm going to to highlight which points could be relevant for a written exam during drawing the cloud. So, yes? Ah, okay. So, what is the cloud? This lecture is called Interventional Medical Image Processing. And this is the cloud. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we are trying to, to su so everybody here, of course, should be on the same page, and we are trying to summarize what we've seen so far in the lecture using this kind of mind map. Yeah? And this is the cloud. And if you've taken an oral exam with us, um, typically, in order to break the ice, uh, it's a good thing that you already know what kind of questions could appear in the oral exam. So we were quite frequently asking, um, if people could summarize the contents of the lecture, and we are doing this exactly with the cloud. But um, in a written exam, there's probably uh, no clouds, but um, we are going to go through the different topics that we heard so far, and we will look into the, um, yeah, we will look into, um, so we will emphasize now a certain points that will be relevant uh, actually for the written exam. Okay, what have we done so far? So we we did uh, IMIP, and what did we do next? So we had a bit of insights that we are now doing interventional, and in interventional, um, you actually have to do real-time processing. So patient is on the table, you're doing image guidance, so you want to be quickly, uh, even if you don't get the best image that you could technically compute, you need an image that is computed fast because you want to help the interventionalists. So there's very strong time constraints. Yeah? So we've seen that. And then uh, we started talking essentially about uh, pre-processing, about um, feature extraction and image interpretation. Yeah? So you could say uh, the what we were first dealing with is essentially a kind of pre-processing. Right. So what did what did we hear so far? So who remembers? Yes. Yeah, we heard about gradients and edges. Gradients and edges. And you've seen that if you want to extract the gradient of an image, you essentially have to compute a vector um, into, and you co uh, compute the derivative with respect to x direction and the derivative with respect to y direction, and this gives you the gradient. And then we've also seen that we can actually compute something um, that allows us to interpret a local area in terms of gradient, and this was called the structure tensor. Yeah? So uh, gradients and edges. So edges are associated with high gradients in the image and uh, the structure tensor. And we've seen that we can actually compute the structure tensor uh, by taking the gradient and multiplying uh, the gradient uh, with its transpose. And am I done already if I do that? Yes? We have to smooth to get rid of the yes, exactly. So we have to smooth. Yeah? So um, 
I'm adding an i here and a sum over a local neighborhood. So i is an element in a local neighborhood. And now I'm adding some weight uh, i. Yeah? And you can also very nicely interpret this. So if you think about this, this is a rank 1 matrix, right? Because it's uh, a vector multiplied with itself. So it's going to be rank 1. But you can also find a geometric interpretation. Let's say you have a vector and you multiply with something um, that is u, u transpose x. Uh, this is the matrix, and I'm multiplying it with an arbitrary vector x. Then you can always uh, interpret this. Th this will become a scalar product. This will project the vector x onto u. So let's say this is u, and you have some arbitrary other vector x. So this will project onto u, and it will be a scalar value. And now if you multiply with u, so these are vectors, you can immediately say, see if you, if you are multiplying with a matrix that has this form, it will always produce a vector that is in the direction of u. And depending on x, you get a different weighting of u. Uh, so you can immediately see that this must be a rank 1 matrix. There is also a geometric reason why it's a rank 1 matrix. Uh, it will always produce a projection onto u, a scalar value, multiplied with a, a direction of u. So if you keep this in mind, this also helps you interpreting like uh, matrix equations. And uh, in our cases, we very often can derive a nice geometric relations that help us understanding the math. Okay, good. So structure tensor, and of course you need to weight this over a, a neighborhood because this will always be a rank one matrix. I mean, we also looked at how we can actually show that it has rank one, and uh, these are just some observations uh, that I'm trying to do in order to highlight the, the interpretations. Uh, we are not just looking at the formula, we are also thinking about the interpretations of the formulas. Okay, good. So... What else did we talk about? Uh, another very important topic was the Wesselness filter. Yeah, Wesselness filter or Frangi filter. So, um, and we found that we in this case we are not using the eigenvalues of the structure tensor because the structure tensor. What did we use the structure tensor for? Do you remember why do we compute eigenvalues? Yeah, for uh, not just for edge, edge detection. Edge detection you can just use on the on the high gradients or edges. Yeah, exactly. So you can differentiate uh, essentially corners, edges, and flat areas. And in the Wesselness filter, we were using the the Hessian, and the Hessian matrix is now a second order derivative, where we compute com uh, derivatives first with uh, two times into x direction then uh, into uh, fx and fy direction, and two times into y direction. Okay, And with this one, you can interpret curvature. So in the Wesselness, we were looking into curvature. And we were, uh, if we have two high eigenvalues here, then we have something that is curved in two directions. And if it's a 2D image, and curvature in x and y direction will form something like a blob. And if you have curvature in one direction and in the perpendicular direction no curvature, you probably have something which looks tubular. So you have a, a tube detector and vessels are essentially tubes, so you can use this to detect vessels. We still had some trouble because vessels had um, different sizes and therefore we were applying different degrees of smoothing, um, which I indicate with sigma here. Uh, so we had different degrees of smoothing of the image. And because of that, we were able to detect larger and smaller structures. And with that, we could then construct um, two immediate numbers which build on the eigenvalues here. So we have this blobness, uh, which was the high well, um, sorry, the low eigenvalue over the high eigenvalue. So you want this uh, to be approximately zero. And the structuredness, which was the square of the two eigenvalues added. 
And with this, you could then construct the actual vesselness measure at the certain scale sigma. And you see this is an advanced class because I'm flipping. So I think we have S in the script. And now I'm using sigma. Yeah, so it's an advanced class. So you expect it to be able to interchangeably use other variable names but still get the same meaning. Yeah? Okay. And of course, there should be some x and y. Yeah? So this is also location dependent. And you can construct now this vesselness uh, to be zero if your first eigenvalue is approximately zero. And otherwise, you are using Gaussian functions. So we are in this lecture, we are using Gaussians all the time. Yeah? Gaussian appears all the time. So we have e to the power of minus um, rb square over, uh, I think we call this 2 times beta square. So this is essentially a Gaussian uh, because we want this to be zero and the Gaussian has its peak at zero. And the then multiply the two, this will be a probability between one and zero. And we multiply with one minus a Gaussian with um, uh, e to the minus uh, s square over 2 times c square and c and beta are essentially standard deviations. This is contrast dependent. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you can pick it just as 0.5 because your uh, blobness will be in between 0 and uh, 1. Good. And with this, we then have a probability at every pixel, at every scale, and the final vesselness you construct with the maximum. And again, a hint why I'm going into so much detail here. Well, it might be relevant for the exam. Okay, good. Uh, one thing that is also very interesting that actually Leonard was talking about is if you have Gaussian convolutions and you do a convolution and another convolution and another convolution, they will cascade. So this is uh, also called cascading, of, of, uh, cascading effect of convolutions. And this is also a very useful property. So if you convolve a Gaussian with a Gaussian, you get another Gaussian. And uh, actually, Leonard uh, uh, did in the uh, last week lecture, he did show that the standard deviations, they um, actually, how they actually add. Right? So if you have two Gaussians and you combine them, so let's put here, So you can uh, actually cascade if you take a Gaussian with uh, sigma 1 and you convolve it with another, another Gaussian, sigma 2. You actually get um, something, another Gaussian, and the two standard deviations will behave like the square root of sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square. And I'm not uh, writing down the, the proof for this right now, but you should remember in order to do this, if you have two Gaussians and convolve them with each other, um, you can use a simple trick. The, well, you could just do the convolution, but instead uh, you can go to Fourier domain and then your um, convolution will become a multiplication. And the uh, standard deviation will actually become one over the standard deviation. So if you go from spatial domain to Fourier domain, the standard deviation of your Gaussian flips. And if you do that, you multiply the two, and then you have the multiplication essentially of two E functions, and then you can um, uh, multiply the two uh, exponential functions, and the uh, standard deviations will actually add up, which then will give you this result in the end. Okay, so uh, this is also something, how to derive this uh, point here is something that you should be aware of uh, when you go to a written exam. Yeah? Of course, you should, be, uh, you should also memorize uh, how, to actually, uh, how actually a Gaussian function looks like. Okay, good. And we've seen that this uh, Gaussian cascading is super useful if you're constructing SIFT features. So if you're constructing the scale invariant feature transform, we've seen that we can actually pick one uh, standard deviation and then do take the same image and convolve it 
and then you convolve it again, and you convolve it again, and you get higher degrees of smoothing every time you do that, and you keep the intermediate result, and at some point the resolution of the image is so low that you can actually take fewer grid points to save all the coefficients, so you can reduce the memory demand by a factor of two, and then you can convolve again and again, and you can build such a kind of pyramid, and every octave, every time you convolve with a, with a, a such that the resolution becomes half, then you can uh, reduce the grid size here without losing any information. Now this is very interesting because now we found a memory efficient way of actually deriving um, different smooth versions of the same image. And then we are also using another trick that we talked about uh, this week already. Then we don't want to, so in instead of computing the second order derivatives um, using, using a Laplacian of Gaussians directly, like we did in Frangi's method, we can use this trick by using a difference of Gaussians. So if you take this version and this version and subtract the two from each other, you are approximating a Mexican head function. Yeah. You may remember that if you take two Gaussians, one uh, rather narrow and a more smooth version of the Gaussian, and you subtract the two, um, then you end up with something that looks like this and this is an approximation of the Mexican head uh, of the Laplacian. And you can use that to compute uh, very efficiently uh, the second order derivatives in this scale space. So this is called a scale space uh, because you have different scaled versions of the image. And now where we stopped last uh, lecture actually is that we were uh, identifying maxima in the scale space. So this is already where we stopped last time. And this is exactly where we will continue. So we want to identify interesting points in an image. And the cool thing that we identified here is that we, so this is, this is your Gaussian pyramid. Yeah, you can see it here. So this is convolving with the same kernel at, uh, again and again. And you get a version that has very high frequency information. And here at the end, you get some uh, version that has very low frequency information. And now you try to find uh, something like blobs in these images. And for example, this could be a blob. And because you know that you have associated a high degree of smoothing here, you immediately know if you find a maximum here, a blob-like maximum here, you also know its size. So this can you then back project to the original image domain and it will identify the entire area here. Yeah? So if you find maxima in your scale space, they are not just points in the image, but they also identify areas. And that's really cool because then you find interesting points in the image and you already know what area they cover. So we solved one of the problems that we discussed earlier, that if you, for example, have a camera image and you go, go closer or farther away, or you have variation in patient sizes, then you might have the same structure, but it just appears at a different size because the patient is bigger or because somebody moved closer to the camera. And you still want to find the same points again. And with this kind of approach, you no, don't just find a point, but you also find the area in the image that it actually covers. And then you can restrict the computation of features to the area that you have identified. And then you automatically get the right size of your interest point. So we detect points at a scale where they make sense. This is how we called it. Good. Um, yeah, and here is just the the approximation here of the Mexican head and um, in comparison to that the difference of Gaussians that you also get some very uh, visually very similar result. Okay and you can think about the interpretation of frequency domain. Good so this is then 
the same image that I've just drawn. This is your scale space and then your difference of Gaussians. And then you can go ahead and detect extrema in the scale space to figure out points um, and their scale. Now we have found interesting points and we want to think about uh, extracting features. And the next thing that we want to do once we have found those, uh, those extrema and, sc and scale space, we want to find a description that will also be invariant to rotations. So if you start rotating your camera somehow, or your patient uh, rotates on the table, let's say maybe you have a scanner where you can, uh, or maybe your, your patient is not uh, lying on the spec side, but on the front side, and suddenly everything flips, uh, and you want to compute features that still uh, can handle this rotation. So what do we do? Um, well, first of all, uh, we might find uh, an extremum in our, our scale space. And now we also want to figure out the true extrema. Yeah? So there's positive and negative extrema. Yeah? Yes? Yes. It depends on how what you subtract from what. If you subtract it the other way around, it will flip. So, so here you subtract it Yes, you take the second one and subtract the first one. If you do it the other way around, it will flip. So the question is why this one is pointing downside. So if you take this and subtract this, you will get this. And if you take this and subtract this, you will it will flip. You just have to... Yeah. It's just as hmm? and it's just a sign change. Yeah. The, uh, I mean uh, th this one is not uh, a Mexican head but it's an uh, upside down Mexican head. But it's it's just a flip of sign. Yeah. Then if you if you flip this then also your extrema in in scale space will will flip. But uh, you're looking for extrema, right? Um and technically uh, on a general image, you cannot just say uh, the structures that I'm interested in are brighter than the background or are uh, darker than the background. In a general image, you can't tell. So you're interested in, in blobs that go down in intensity, but also in upwards. If you know that you're looking at a cell image, and uh, for this specific cell, the general appearance, uh, appearance should be brighter, then you can discard all the dark um, uh, minima. Yeah. So this has to do with the illumination. And if you have prior knowledge, so for example in cell imaging, um, in particular cell lines, you know that they have to appear, appear bright or they have to appear dark, and then you can get rid of all key points that have the wrong sign. So you can remove them because you have some prior knowledge. And there's actually methods uh, in literature that do that. Um, for cell counting, for example, that you can, in this way, you can also differentiate different kinds of cells in the same image. So, uh, is it it, it, it will it will only flip the sign in your scale space. So it, it, it so if this is your your scale space, uh, the curve would be flipped. But if you're looking for minima and maxima for both, then it it doesn't matter actually. Um, exactly. So, but th the thing is, we sample the scale space, of course, at equidistant points because we're convolving with the same Gaussian all the time. But your true extrema might be at different locations. They might be in between. So you detected this as extremum and this as extremum, but in fact they are at this size. So what you do is you fit a curve through your scale space um, points where you suspect extrema, and then you try to detect uh, the true extremum. So here, for example, the it may be in between of those two points. And here, the extremum is actually in between of those two points if you split it, uh, fit a degree of a uh, curve of a certain degree. And this is now nice, because with this method, you can then also um, identify key points that are not um, 
uh, multiplications of your um, standard deviation that you use for convolution. If you don't do this, you will only be able to identify key points at uh, integer, um, at integer uh, multiplications of the standard deviation. But if you do such a localization in scale space, you can also uh, find key points that are in between two scale levels. So this is also useful. Okay. Then you can um, eliminate unstable interest points. So you compute the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix uh, and try to find, of course, blobs. And now you end up with a set of good points. And these good points have uh, x, y coordinate and a scale. OK. And in the next step, we want to figure out the orientation of the point. So let's say somebody twists his head in an image. Uh, you still want to be able to uh, get rid of that. Uh, or if you just take a, a, a cell image and somebody rotates it, you still want to be able to identify the same cells. So we need to do something about the rotation invariance. And now what, uh, what they do in SIFT is actually a, a quite clever idea. So you can actually use, you can define a patch. And now this patch here, this is a 6 by 6 patch. And this patch is now defined in scale space coordinates. Uh, so the, the size here and the size upwards here is, is, is defined in multiples of the scale. So you could say the, the length of this side of this patch is two standard deviations, uh, for example. You can, you can define that. Uh. So let's say this is uh, two standard deviations long in this direction and in this direction. You will be able to identify a patch. And within this patch, you take smaller patches and compute the average gradient orientation. So this is what we've done, uh, we've done here. We indicate the gradient orientation of all of these patches with the arrows. So you have stronger gradients here. There's a stronger intensity change in this area. And here you have rather homogeneous areas, so the arrows are rather short. And what you do now is you take the gradient and you compute the angle. You compute the angle of the gradient. You can do that. And you can compute the gradient magnitude. Uh, this is also a way of representing the gradient angle and magnitude will also give you a vector quantity. And what you do next is you actually sum up all of these gradient magnitudes and you bin this in directions. So here in this example we have uh, a total of eight bins for the different directions. So we say right, top right, top, top left, left, bottom left, bottom, bottom right. These are eight directions that you can find in a 2D space. And now you, in every bin here, you add up the gradient magnitudes. So you try to identify the uh, not just the average orientation in the patch, but also the strongest direction within this patch. This will give you a essentially a gradient histogram. Um, so, yeah, you can, of course, also weight this with a Gaussian here, but then you will only get the central orientation. But typically, um, everything within the patch is regarded as important. So, let's say you have um, um, a zebra crossing-like structure in here. You want to be able to identify the main gradient orientation. Huh? So, but uh, here we essentially apply the weighting with the strength of the gradient because we just add up the magnitudes. Good, and then we do this, and here in this very nice case, uh, you find that there is a clear maximum here. And um, actually, uh, this is flipped, this is transposed. It should be actually the top left, right? But it's uh, pointing to the bottom left, okay. You see, this is an advanced course, yeah? You, you still are expected uh, to understand 
that the majority of those arrows are pointing into one direction, and this is, uh, yeah, okay, good. So you can understand that this is the major direction, and what you now do is um, you assign this direction to the key point. So now you've found a dominant direction, and now you have several features. So you have the position, you have the size, and you have the dominant direction. Now this is cool because now you can do everything in an oriented uh, coordinate system. So now you can now that you know this uh, direction, you start to extract your features again, but you do everything in a rotated coordinate system. So if you found the dominant direction of a face and somebody tilts it and tilts it to the other side, you will always find the same dominant direction in this patch. And all your features that you compute, you do with respect to the scale and the dominant orientation. So you normalize out scale and orientation. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So if you if you this depends on your application. So you can also apply a curve fitting and then try to interpolate the dominant direction and not just use the the bin here. Uh, but this really depends uh, depends on your application and how sensitive it really is to or, uh, to orientation. So in in several applications, uh, such a binning is already quite good. But of course, you can uh, really try to estimate the true dominant direction. So after you did that, um, you find the direction of the key point, and then you can generate key points. Now you might uh, also have the case, let's say it's a direction here in between, um, or you have actually two dominant directions. Then what you do is you find the maximum, and I think it is, it's on the next slide? Yeah, this is on the next slide. So let's say you found dominant direction this way and this way. Uh, maybe this is a, a kind of zebra pattern or something which has two dominant directions. Um, then what you can also do is you can look at the maximum key point direction and everything that is within 20%. Um, within so everything that is higher than 80% of the dominant key point direction, you just create another key point because uh, you can just create the same key point twice, but in the opposite orientation. Uh, so this way you can handle ambiguities that you get in the, in the dominant orientation. And this way you can uh, ge uh, generate a lot of candidates that will uh, give you good points um, for matching. Uh. Good, excellent. So we found the orienta we found the uh, orientation we found the size we found the location so what do we do next uh, this is the 80% of the maximum value okay the next is we do a key point descriptor and now everything we do we do within a local coordinate system so let's say this is two times the same image but here we actually rotated this image but it's two, two times the same uh, the same key point and your SIF detector, um, if it detects this key point, it should also detect this key point. And now you grid everything, so you resample everything into this pa in this patch, again maybe to a five times five grid, and extract your features on a local coordinate system, on a local size, and um, you should get actually the same descriptor if uh, very similar descriptors if you extract it from this area and from this area uh, because it has an orientation and it has uh, a size. So then you can uh, size independently, match two points and rotation independently. So this is very useful and it's really popular and it would be nice to own the pattern, right? <laughs> Good, so if you see that, I can actually rotate this. Ah, this is a brilliant animation, isn't it? So everybody here just got the idea of the local coordinate system. Good. So now what we do is we have to build a descriptor. And we again use uh, this idea of, um, of, local, uh, of local gradients. Now what we do again is 
um, we do find a grid within our oriented patch now, not in the original image coordinate uh, system, but in the local coordinate system. We compute such a patch, and then we can com uh, compute uh, gradient histograms uh, for, for every of those patches. And in this way, we can encode the local edge information in different directions. And this builds you uh, a SIF descriptor. Now, this gradient has actually a couple of um, advantages. And one advantage is, uh, for example, that you also become independent of illumination. So if you have, uh, let's say, the sun is moving across the sky, the illumination will change. So you have more light or a cloud goes above the sky and you have less light or somebody switches on and off the light, then um, you will have different gray values, different absolute gray values. But if you use gradients, they are much more robust to absolute changes in the gray value. So if you compute, um, let's say, an L2 norm, and just a, a Euclidean distance in between two vectors and you use gradient information, they will be much more similar than if you use absolute values of gray values. So then they will, th of course, this also depends on your application. If you know that you have a calibrated image, let's say everything in your image is uh, Hounsfield units, which has like a, a, which are calibrated, then you might want to include, you might want to alter this descriptor also to include absolute values instead of gradient values, because you don't want to map something in the lung to something in the liver, because they are different in terms of absorption. But it might be useful again, because you have, um, you may have changes in the illumination, and in terms of uh, CT, that would be a different acceleration voltage. So you have different peak voltages in the spectrum, and then you suddenly get different impression of different materials. Because Hounsfield units are only valid or only comparable over the entire spectral range for water and for air. Because for air, you have them defined to be zero, and for uh, sorry, for air you have the, it defined to be minus a thousand, and for water you have exactly zero. These are the two calibration components of the Hounsfield scale, but dependent on different um, uh, acceleration voltages, the material dependent absorption is different. So everything in between uh, might have a different range. Yeah. It's not just because different tissues in different bodies have the different uh, uh, different density. So if you have an elderly person. And a young person, the bone density will, of course, change. But also, depending on the illumination, on the KVP, you have a change in Hounsfield units in bone, just because you are using a different spectrum for to do the imaging. Yeah. So in this case, again, it might be useful to also include gradient information, because you're more interested in the structure than in the absolute um, gray value. Okay, but these are all considerations you have to do when you're designing your, your feature descriptor. So you have to know your application, of course, and your imaging modality and so on. And then you can easily alter this. So these are design considerations. Good. Um, the next thing you can do is, um, of course, you can also think about the dimensionality. Yeah? You want to, of course, not to have uh, too high dimensionality in your descriptor, because if you're descriptor is, let's say, um, uh, one million dimensions, uh, and you just think about the sparsity in the space. I mean, you can think of the, the curse of dimens dimensionality for feature matching uh, already um, in a 2D space and a 1D space. Let's say you have a one feature, and you sample 10 points. Uh, OK, we sample five points in this feature space. You will see that we have a rather dense sampling here. Now, if you do the same in a 2D space, and you take five points, um, you will find that um, you have a much, uh, uh, much more coarse sampling. So you probably want to have five sample points in this and this direction in order to fill your space. And now you do this in 3D. If you have five points in 3D, um, then you sample very little. Uh, so if you increase your dimensionality and have a high dimensional feature vector, you also have to be careful with the sampling. So you probably need a lot of feature points in order to get a representative sampling of your feature space. Uh, if you have a 100 dimensional feature space, but only 10 observations, then yeah, 
not all of these dimensions might actually be that useful. Good. So curse of dimensionality. Be careful and think about the data that you actually have at hand when you're uh, considering your feature. I mean, this is this is something if you do pattern recognition and um, then also feature selection, this is really great. Uh, so if you start uh, constructing, uh, let's say we're constructing random observations and we do 100 dimensions in every vector and we just fill uh, 10 vectors with random observations, just a random number generator. And then you want to classify them into two classes, then uh, you can uh, even though that they are random, you can uh, get arbitrary class alignments very easily if you then start selecting features because there's a certain high uh, likelihood that even if you do cross-validation um, that you will have generated a feature just at random that separates your two classes um, and you just have way too few observations to actually figure out that the obse observation was random. Yeah? So you have to be careful with that. If you use many many features, few observations, and then you add feature selection, you can very easily create highly optimistic results. Yeah. You end up with great classification rates, um, but uh, the observation is actually random. Okay, so you can also alter this. So let's say um, you're looking for pedestrians. If you're looking for pedestrians, um, you can also describe a, a feature uh, combination like this. So typically, pedestrians uh, are taller than uh, wide. So you can already uh, find that your descriptor should, uh, should be longer in this direction than in the other direction. And you typically also know that if you have a camera image and the camera is fixed, uh, pedestrians don't appear at all the scales, right? Uh, don't appear at all the orientations. So th typically, they're upright. Huh? So you can also use that in your, in your selection. And now what you can do is you can, uh, for example, compute those histogra uh, gradient histograms. But what may actually happen in an image of a pedestrian is he may wa uh, walk out of a shadow and half of the pedestrian is within the shadow and the other half is no longer in the shadow. And this will uh, also affect your uh, features that you are extracting. And then what you can do in order to compensate for that, uh, you can actually compute areas and do a block normalization in order to get rid of uh, illumination effects that uh, actually appear within your feature descriptor. And this is then um, a block normalization and this feature descriptor uh, is called histogram uh, of oriented gradients. And uh, this is very useful, very successful for pedestrian tracking. Okay. So just an idea of what you can do uh, and how to develop a specific uh, descriptor for a specific task. Yeah. So a lot of people have thought um, if, you, if you do computer vision, you can design specific features for any application and uh, you will never run out of business because for every application you can define a new feature descriptor and tweak it until you have a very good classification performance. And um, yeah, then suddenly big data struck and people came uh, to the idea that you can uh, do a lot with convolution net uh, convolutional neural networks and try to actually also learn feature representations directly from huge amounts of data. Uh, but if you want to do that successfully, you typically need uh, a couple of million images uh, to actually learn those representations. But we've seen in computer vision that uh, a lot of the automatically learned feature representations uh, actually outperformed handcrafted features like this one here. Uh, but still, if you have a limited data problem, then you can have a look at it and def design a very successful features. And typically in the medical domain, we have only access to very limited data. Uh, but still, big data is, uh, is a big thing right now. And there's, there's a research project now that's going to be funded for the next um, I think the next 10 years, this is called National Cohort, which is going to um, uh, track, I think, uh, 200,000 people. And they will do <coughs> they will do a DNA analysis of 200,000 people at different points in time. And at the same time, uh, they will select a subset of people from this group 
um, I think uh, something like 30,000 people that will receive MR imaging to create a population study. So they will do four MR scans of 30,000 people uh, at four different time at, at four different time points. So they will do MR scans four different time uh, points, 30,000 people, and will try to build a population model um, from people within the age uh, from 20 to 80 years old. So they will construct something. And of course, the idea is that you have to start imaging and collecting biomarkers before the actual onset of disease. So this is why you do it for 10 years, because you expect um, some persons in this group to actually develop um, a kind of illness. And then you will be able to identify uh, biomarkers that are predictors of certain diseases before they actually start. And it's not just in Germany. There's um, actually worldwide different projects going on where they go really big into medical data and try to find uh, useful biomarkers. Yeah, so interesting. And of course, um, it's great to have a lot of data. But if you don't have a lot of data, then you still uh, have to rely on handcrafting and understanding your problem and designing features that are very useful for your problem. Good. And of course, this costs a lot of money. Just the data generation is, is a huge project. And I imagine, uh, pretty sure that just the, the one recording session uh, of, of one person easily, of the MR data, easily costs a thousand euros. And I think also for the DNA analysis, you are about uh, 500 euros for, for sequencing of, of the genome. So this is an incredibly uh, expensive study actually constructing all this data. And of course, then you also realize why people don't like to share their data just at random, because they spend a lot of money in generating this data. So this is also one of the reasons why uh, not just because med it's medical data and it contains uh, patient health information, but also because people like to do their own research with it and not share it with other people because then they could do the research. So they sit on their data as, as if it's a, a big amount, uh, like a treasure, essentially. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a treasure. And you keep your treasure. Exactly. Good. And then, of course, matching correspondence search. So we know how to detect points now. We know to how to detect feature descriptors. And now we have to match them. And what could we do is, well, we could just find the nearest neighbor and search through all the feature vectors. So you can do distance metrics, L1, Euclidean, kullberg uh, liebler divergence. So plenty of distance measures you can look at. And then, of course, um, you want to remove outliers. Huh? So you want to make sure that your matches are somehow consistent. So if you match several key points, so let's say you want to match this data set with this data set, uh, and you got this and this correspondence, then you probably want to get rid of this and this correspondence because they are not in line with the other two. Right? So if you try to do matching between two scenes, then you also want to uh, remove outliers after you found good matches. And then the next step, so we now we remove the outliers. You can do clustering strategies and so on, but we won't go into too much detail here. But uh, of course, you can spend plenty of heuristics on this outlier removal. Think of smart ideas, how to get rid of them. And also, um, you can explore different kinds of distance metrics. Actually, if you have enough data, you can even learn your own distance metric. Yeah. You can just learn the difference between two points if you know the correspondence. So for the matching, then, after you found um, uh, your feature vectors, you can do one thing, you can do a um, uh, complete search. You just do a brute force search. And then the curse of dimensionality really hits you bad, because you have your 10,000-dimensional uh, uh, 10, feature space, and then you search through all the observations. and just Im So let's, let's say your feature space is only 6, yeah? and you want to have, um, uh, in every dimension, you want to sample at least 10 times uh, then you get uh, 10 to the power of 6 uh, feature points that you actually want to sample, right? So you need you already need a million observations to have a rather 
dense sampling here. And of course, if you have 10,000, then you will need a lot of more uh, features to actually sample densely your entire space. And if you do that, and then you start comparing every point with every other point, or you just get one new point, you have to compare it to all the other points. This will take forever. So you need a, a clever matching strategy. And something that is really useful uh, are acceleration structures. So you can, for example, if you do a na nearest neighbor matching, you can use a KD tree, uh, or you can do hashing, and uh, then you can partition your data and just um, look for, for the next neighbor. So this is, this is uh, quite popular that you uh, partition, so you look for representative samples, and then you make them like key points and you first compare to the representative samples and then to the subsamples and this will accelerate dramatically your search for the nearest neighbor. So this is very common. Something that is really useful if you want to implement it on a graphics card is uh, called the random ball cover. And here you are sampling, it's an efficient acceleration structure for nearest neighbor search. And you can do this in parallel. So this is, uh, for example, these are your data points. And then you just randomly select a subset of those data points. And then you find the closest points to every of these data points. And if you have a sufficient number of representatives, you will immediately find, um, I mean, you will immediately find um, a sampling of your data and you will automatically partition your data if you do so. And you just do this once. And now if you want to search, then you start with these. Uh, so you build those lists and those lists contain the nearest neighbors. And now if you start searching with a query point, then all you have to do is you have in the first pass, you compare it to all the representative points. And in the second pass, you only compare it to the points that were nearest neighbors to the representative. And in this way, you can do this very efficiently par in parallel for querying. OK, and then you find your match, and you're all good. And this is the point that you selected. So this is the, the, the match in the representative point, and then you find this point as the nearest neighbor. And of course, this is approximative. Yeah. So this is not this is not necessarily the true nearest neighbor. There is some degree of approximation, and you can then oversample the sizes. So you can say um, you can also include nearest neighbors in two lists. Yeah. So you can um, actually not just take the real nearest neighbor and partition this, but you can also then increase. Uh, the sizes and to have an overlap of 10% or 20% and then the degree of approximation of course gets better. Good. Let's talk a bit about some uh, applications. So now we found, uh, figured out how to find uh, interesting points in an image and of course the great benefit of this is that you can reduce the number of search queries a lot. So you're no longer matching all of the points in the image but you're only matching points that, ha that are interesting to some degree and now you can do things really quickly so for example um, some examples we have here is in microscopy in augmented reality and uh, in patient positioning and yeah here you see the the these are actually histological slices and here we want to um, find two matching um, uh, slice images and then stitch them together so here we can find representative points and of course one of the problems that we that we have here is that there might not be an entire overlap between the two uh, sliced images and then we can match them and align them to each other and stitch them together. Another thing you can do is um, organ registration for for range image imaging CT yeah? so you have two different modalities one is uh, the range the service image camera and another one is a prior knowledge from a CT data scan where you have uh, already extracted the surface of the organ and then you can match the two and of course here you have to design new features because what you want to do is you want to match surface points it's no longer directly image points and what you do then is 
uh, find local descriptors that work on local curvature. So points that have a high degree of curvature on the surface are also interesting points on the surface. So you analyze the local curvature and also the normal direction of the curvature and then you can also construct key points here and then you can do uh, a surface to surface matching and it's the same magic pipeline. And here you see a um, demonstration of a scan and the surface and in the false colors you can see how well they match and generally the two surfaces match pretty well after the registration. Uh, so of course uh, here you want to have uh, 3D local invariant feature descriptors. So what do you do here? You can uh, actually look at the, the normals here, at the surface normals and then you can start extracting um, uh, you can extracting the gradient orientations in those histograms and here you can for example uh, subdivision this into uh, into circular areas to build your feature descriptor so there's there's uh, different feature descriptors available in the in the literature so you can search for mesh hog riff and so on okay and then you you match and uh, this is another application here you can see the experiment uh, with a mannequin and uh, this this thing here is a CT scan of the mannequin and this uh, is the is the surface extracted from the range image and you have some initialization then you find key points and then you match them to each other and uh, this works very well in this application I mean here the rigid body assumption is of course absolutely valid because the mannequin uh, doesn't deform in any way, so you can, can get very good matches here. Good. And you see that the limitations of this match uh, rather occur from the accuracy of the sensor than actually from, from the object. Yeah. So you can see here these points uh, have a pretty bad match and the reason is uh, because you have a normal direction that cannot be very well uh, sensed by the, um, by the surface camera sensor. If you have a, a surface normal that is uh, perpendicular to the viewing uh, direction or almost perpendicular, then you don't get a very good image in the surface camera from so this. Yeah. Can I ask that on the reason why mapping won't be accurate anymore? So, for example, the visual resolution you're seeing is like deformed a little. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you work with deformable objects, of course, you you either have to model it or you. Um, uh, you have to think about that. So one thing you can do is you can, for example, try to do a non-rigid registration. So you first start with a rigid approach and then you have some remaining deformation and then you non-rigidly map the two. So this is something that is done. Um, and another thing that is also interesting, um, there's even approaches. So sometimes you have a surgery on the organ, right? So you start cutting the organ. So you can even model the tissue deformation that is introduced by the cut using finite en uh, elements. Yeah. So, and then you, you, you track the instrument and how you cut the organ. So you, you, t you often do excisions. And then you actually model the, the entire organ and uh, the, uh, the cutting instrument and try to overlay this. So this, I mean, this is still research directions. It uh, takes quite some time to compute this. But um, it's actually done, so there's literature uh, available. And to be honest, they also have cool videos. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and this is now the application in a real radiation treatment. So we already had that in the previous lecture. And you want to uh, avoid uh, radiation exposure during the patient positioning. So what you do is you take a surface camera and then you try to automatically align the table position with the prior CT where you did all the planning on. Uh, and of course here um, you have to be careful. So I mean in the abdomen you probably have some motion uh, and there could also be some internal deformation. Uh, so for example if you're trying to treat a lung tumor this is commonly done also with, um, uh, with x-ray guidance uh, and for, for Lung tumors, what you often do is you actually actually implant a gold marker uh, because you can then track the gold marker uh, very easily in an X-ray projection. 
and then you make sure that you only irradiate once the gold marker is in the same position as the planning uh, CT. So you do the planning on a static volume where you, where you virtually stop the breathing motion and you only irradiate if you are sure that the tumor is in the same position as the planning CT. And then, of course, you can do uh, real-time adaptations. So then tr try tracking the tumor and then you have multiple uh, dose simulations and then you try to interpolate the best uh, radiation exposure for the current patient position. Uh, that's uh, a rather difficult problem, but you can actually uh, do that. Uh, and of course, one direction here in research is uh, because uh, breathing is, is a problem. Yeah. So you, what you try to do is you try to uh, get the dose into the patient as fast as possible. So if you had a device that could deliver, let's say, dose from all directions, and that's actually done in research, they're trying to develop new treatment devices where you actually irradiate from all directions, uh, then you could actually deliver the treatment dose uh, in, in less than a second. Uh, you can do that in, 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 in a few milliseconds, the entire treatment dose. And then, of course, um, you just need a single planning uh, uh, planning step, then you put the patient in, and if the patient is not exactly in the right position, you want to uh, update your planning to the current patient position, and if you do that very quickly, you can maybe do that in a single breath hold. So you put the patient in, scan him in a CT gantry, ask him to hold the, the breath for, let's say, uh, I, I don't think you can ask for more than 30 seconds, but maybe maybe 20 seconds. So you need to update your planning and uh, imaging and the irradiation within 20 seconds. This is about the time constraints that you would have. And then you would be able to deliver highly accurately those only to the actual position where the tumor is. And then you get rid of the entire motion problem and the tracking and so on. And it's also very good for the patient because he doesn't have to spend uh, a long time in the treatment device and wait uh, for the all the gating procedures and so on but you could treat him right away, deliver the dose, and take the patient out. Yeah, but uh, these devices are only under development. They are not clinically available yet. Okay, good. So we had a couple of applications. Then we also have a couple of references. So um, here you can see um, uh, the original SIF paper uh, as the first reference, then uh, this comparison of different interest point detectors and you can see that this comparison was done in, in 2000 and then in 2004 you had a, a scale and rotation invariant descriptor that essentially fixed the main problems that occurred in those interest point detectors. Good. And what else? The Harris corner detector we have in there and yeah, some papers on object recognition. Interesting thing is uh, you can actually download, uh, this is, how bad is that? You put a patent on it and then you put it available for everybody to download. <laughs> so you can figure out that it's really good and then uh, you have to pay to use it. <laughs> yeah, and this is uh, the Hawk framework. You can also download directly from MATLAB. Good. Oh, and here's a, um, MATLAB um, implementation of the Harris corner detector. Okay, anyway. Who wants to use MATLAB anyway? <laughs> Good. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Why do we look on SIFT if everybody uses SERF? Uh, they are very similar. No, I mean in in surf you use integral images, so there's there's some difference, but um, the I think it's sufficient to look at SIFT. I, I think it would be very boring if we go through all the feature descriptors that are out there. So it's it's sufficient to look at one. I think you you got the concept, and if you look at the surf paper, you will realize that you you will also be it. It's nice. Um, but you will realize that it's... Uh, so the nice thing with SURF is, is that you can use integral images, uh, but uh, we will actually introduce integral images uh, for a different algorithm, 
which is exactly the image enhancement. So we'll use integral images for uh, computation of box filters. Yeah. Box filters are cool. Yeah. Does everybody know average or box filters? So this is a uh, it's also a low pass filter, right? And uh, the box filter is just uh, a filter kernel that has all. So this will just compute the average in a local area. Yeah? So this is a box filter. And now you can imagine uh, this is maybe still computationally efficient, but let's say uh, I put a filter with length 20 in this and this direction, and I try to compute this in spatial domain. This will take a lot of time, right? So this is quite inefficient. And now you can use this concept of uh, integral images. And integral images are really useful uh, because with integral images you can compute this much faster. And in order to compute an integral image, you just um, uh, compute, uh, you, you build an image. Uh, so let's say this is, uh, let's say this is your image. And then you build an integral image has the same size. And what you do is you just say that the value at this point is the integral of the of this area in the image. Yeah? This is so you can construct this in a forward manner because you can build the so the integral of this pixel, it, let's make an example. So let's say this is two, three, four, uh, then you can build the integral image, of course the integral of this point will be 2, then the integral over here will be 5, and the integral over this entire patch will then be 5 plus 4, so it will be 9. Uh, and now you can also start building this, so let's put, uh, okay, this is a very homogeneous image which has all 2's here, uh, so you get uh, a 4 here, uh, because it's this plus this, and then you need uh, to compute the entire area over this image. So you need essentially this patch plus this patch. Uh, so this is going to be 5. Um, uh, so this is going to be 5. And then you have to subtract this. Uh, this is also 9. Yeah? So you can see the, the algorithm which I actually built it. Yeah? So in order to compute this integral image, um, well, you can just say that you take the integral of this and you need to construct the integral of this so you need to subtract this again yeah. so i just have to add this value subtract this value uh, and add back this value and then you can construct this uh, in a forward manner so you can uh, com construct those integral images very efficiently and now if you have those integral images you can very easily construct any patch within this image um, by just taking four points here. So let's say you want to compute the integral over this area. Then all you need to do is um, you need to take the entire area here. And then you subtract, of course, this area. And you subtract this area. And then you need to su uh, add back this area. OK? So you only have to access four uh, arrays in this integral image to construct the integral here. And it doesn't matter what size it is. So in the integral image, you just um, uh, take those four points, subtract this area, subtract this area, add the entire area, and the area you're missing here to the top. Yeah? Doesn't matter. You can even in a bigger image, let's say you want to compute this area here, so you can construct it by adding, let's say this is area 1, so it's going to be area 1, and then we have this area here is going to be area 2, sorry, this is bad. So area 1 is maybe here, yeah, because it's the entire area, and then area 2 is this part here, and area 3 is this part here. So you take area 1 and you subtract uh, number 2, and you also subtract number 3. And then you realize you subtract this area two times, so you need to add it back. So this is area 4. 
So you add back the area four. And in this way, you only have to access four memory cells and you can compute any integral in the original image, image from your integral image. And now this is very cool because then you can also compute box filters of 20 by 20 with only four times accessing the memory. So this is very nice. The bad, so we can do this in, in a constant complexity. Yeah. So it's the number of pixels and then uh, constant. So the box filter has, uh, is only dependent on the image size and it's linear in the image size. So this has a linear complexity. That's that's really useful. So you can do this very efficiently. The bad thing about this is uh, it doesn't preserve any edges. So typically, what you want to do in an image is you want to preserve edges. So you want to smooth in areas where you have homogeneous regions, and you want to preserve the edges. And something that is do we actually have that on here? So what do we have he in here? Oh yeah, we're going through all of this. Okay, good. So uh, something that we want to do, again, we have the motivation and range imaging, but technically you can use that uh, on other any other imaging modality. You can construct very similar filters um, and use them. So here the application is again range imaging and now a range imaging in abdominal surgery. So what you do is, um, uh, this is different sensors, so in general two Technologies for range imaging are very popular. Uh, one is uh, was used in the Kinect One, and this was using a structured light, and you are uh, sensing the pattern and reconstructing the depth, which will give you a dense field. And another technology that is very popular is so-called time-of-flight imaging. And time-of-flight imaging is irradiating light into the scene, and it is um, light of a certain frequency and then you can measure the frequency of the light and by the shift in phase, you can compute how much time was lost um, by the reflection of the light. Uh, so you're essentially measuring the time of the light to the scene and back. So this is why they're called time of flight cameras. And from that, you can recover the distance. And the nice thing with these time of flight cameras is also you get a dense field so you get a, a dense observation. And with both camera technologies, you can also extract um, uh, you can also extract depth information even if there's no texture because you are using active light here. So even if you're imaging a white wall, you will still get depth information, which is a typical problem in all uh, feature tracking based techniques. Good. So with that, you can um, also go ahead and um, do a 3D imaging. And uh, one thing where you could uh, uh, use that is, uh, for example, in open surgery, and you're interested in the, in the organ surface. So there's, uh, in CT, you only have black and white images, yeah? Uh, but as soon as you go to open surgery and endoscopy, you get very colorful images. And yeah, for, for my, point of view, I prefer the black and white images, but <laughs> it's always nice to also show some colors on the slides, right? <laughs> okay, so this is open surgery, and here you can also uh, try to do navigation. Y let's say you have a liver tumor, and you want to uh, cut it out, and it's somewhere in the liver. You want to uh, get an, a surface image and then uh, do a kind of registration approach on, on navigation. Good. Uh, Typical problem with time of flight cameras is the, the sensor is super noisy. Yeah. You have a lot of noise in the images and um, you need to get rid of them and you do that with, uh, of course, edge preserving noise filtering. Here you see a, um, a prototype uh, of 2D RGB camera and it also has 3D depth information. So this is actually something um, th that we also came up with. Um, we were developing an endoscope where we also hooked up a time of flight camera onto the endoscopy optics. And then you get an endoscope that is not giving you just um, a 2D image, but also at the same time, you'll get depth information. 
and then you can also use this kind of technology in endoscopy. So we were very much as excited about this when we actually built the first prototypes because then you can suddenly uh, also measure things. Yeah? With the endoscope optics you typically have deformation and you have the problem with distance. So measurements are uh, rather difficult. But as soon as you use like time of flight, you actually get metric distances and then you can also measure path lengths along organ surfaces and so on. So this is quite interesting technology. Uh, okay, so but now you build this and you're very happy that you have built it, uh, but the first uh, signal that you get looks like this. This is, uh, this is one of the surface images that we got and this is actually just a phantom experiment. So the first thing that you can do is uh, say, okay, this has a rather high frame rate. So let's do a little temporal averaging. So you do temporal averaging and then you already get rid of a bit of the noise. So you just apply the average value of a, of a time direction. This already helps, but you still have quite some noise. Yeah, and then uh, you apply something like bilateral filtering and bilateral filtering is one of the standard approaches to do edge preserving filtering and this helps a lot. So here you can see that we very nicely preserve the edges and at the same time the noise is suppressed very efficiently. So bilateral filtering or edge preserving filtering techniques are used a lot and because you uh, can compute them in parallel you can actually uh, implement this on graphics hardware and do it very very efficiently. But uh, if you have larger kernel sizes, the bilateral filter also suffers from the uh, problem that it becomes more and more complex. So if you have large bilateral filters, then uh, you end up with uh, very high computation times. Okay, but still, so this is a video uh, of, the, of the original image data and the phantom here. And let's see what happens. Do we have, yeah, so now we uh, did uh, an outlier detection. So this was an artifact that you've seen in the center where because the uh, surface was reflecting too much. This is the temporal averaging effect. So you see this, uh, this uh, movement noise goes away. And now we can also add uh, edge preserving filtering. And then you get something like this. So this is a much better surface impression that you had previously. With the raw data that you get from the center, um, I don't think you get a very good, even if you try to measure something there, if you have uh, noise in centimeter range uh, then <laughs> and you want to measure a surface with, with, with uh, differences in a couple of millimeters, it's really a problem. But the frame rates are hard, so you can use temporal averaging and you can use, uh, of course, reflectance maps will tell you uh, positions of unreliable measurements. So if you have too much reflectance, uh, you, you get outliers. Yeah? Um, and you can also do something about the outlier compensation, which we will also see here. So this is what we will do about the outliers. Um, we will do something called normalized convolution. Normalized convolution is pretty nice to remove outliers. Then um, I will shortly tell you something about bilateral filtering. And I think we can, we can still do the normalized convolution and the, and the bilateral filtering. And in the next lecture, we will look into the guided filter. And just um, uh, to give you an outlook, the guided filter is, is really cool because it's very, very efficient. So because we will adopt the idea of box filters and in integral images, and we will actually employ it to construct an edge preserving filter. And this will be very efficient. Um, good, so what's normalized convolution? Uh, let's, let's shortly, uh, uh, define a couple of uh, quantities here in the following the number of pixels will be n even if it's a 2d image but it uh, we just do a linear index over all the uh, points in the image so we have n pixels and we have some discrete pixel index uh, that will be x and y and you can also write it in vector notation as a bold vector x and then we have some um, local neighborhood that we will call omega x this is the essentially the filter domain. This defines the local neighborhood of the filter size. Here in this kernel, uh, we would have a three by three size, or uh, if you go to here, this would be a neighborhood of 20 by 20. Okay, good. And of course, there is a certain number of elements in here 
uh, which is the, the cardinality of your kernel size that just gives you the number of the uh, elements in here. And here we chose to define it not as an absolute number, but as a kind of radius in order to enforce always um, uh, odd kernel sizes. So uh, if we want to make this true here, then we want to have, of course, an odd kernel size, because if you have an odd kernel size, then you always have a center pixel. OK, so this would be then uh, 21 here. And uh, of course, this would be a radius of 1 for the small example. And then 2 times 1 plus 1 would be a kernel size of 3. And then, of course, the cardinality would be 9 um, that we get in this local neighborhood. Then the filter input will be the corrupted noisy image G. And the filter output will be the restored denoised image F. So these are our quantities. And then we can um, build um, a discrete convolution. And the discrete convolution here would just be the convolution of the kernel K with the image uh, G. And the output would be F. So this is if we would just apply a discrete convolution, then we would have a weighted sum of the uh, convolved image. And we typically normalize with the quantities within the kernel. So we take the sum over the local no neighborhood in the kernel and the weighted image in the local neighborhood weighted with the kernel. So in this example, um, you would get um, in the numerator, you would, of course, take your image and weight it with the individual weights here, multiply them each with each other and sum them up. And then in the uh, denominator, uh, denominator, you just take the sum over all the elements in the kernel, and it would be 9 here. Uh, so you normalize out the, the weight of the kernel, such that the input image and the output image are still in the same domain. So you don't want to scale with your convolution. So this, for example, would be a Gaussian kernel, where you can just take uh, the exponent uh, exponential function and construct a Gaussian kernel, and we're using this all the time. Uh, or you could also use a box filter, but um, we will keep the Gaussian here in the following. And of course, this discrete convolution would give you something uh, that would be linear and shift invariant. So the uh, uh, convolution theorem would hold. And instead of doing the multiplication, uh, the convolution in spatial, in the, uh, spatial domain, you can just compute the uh, Fourier transforms independently, multiply them, and do the inverse. Fourier transform. So if you have very large kernels, uh, this is a very efficient implementation. Uh, but it's going to be a, a linear and a shift invariant. So this kind of kernel uh, is just a discrete convolution. Now, if you want to get rid of certain areas that are defective, that don't uh, deliver, um, uh, that don't deliver reliable information, like we've seen in a previous example. You remember the spike in the center. And you can use a very simple trick. You can apply uh, a weighting. So instead of just um, taking this kernel uh, here, you split it up into two parts. So you still take um, a weighting kernel, but you multiply it uh, with some uh, certainty or um, uh, if you, so you, you crea create a, a mapping which essentially weights if the pixel is valid or not. And if you have an invalid measurement where you have way too high, uh, let's say the pixel says the object is three meters away, but the, the object can only be 30 centimeters away or 10 centimeters away because you're inside the body and the, it cannot be that the surface inside the body is suddenly outside, you can actually determine this and you have an invalid pixel. Or you can also de uh, uh, determine it if you have the reflectivity of the point. So if there's too much reflectance measured at this point, the, the too high intensity, the um, measurement can also be invalid. So let's say you have some way of determining which measurement is invalid. Then you can say, I assign the weight 0. So what you do is you cancel out all the measurements that are invalid and still compute a convolution. Uh, and of course, this is no longer shift invariant because you have local information that you're uh, uh, computing in here. So all the filter masks may appear different. 
at every point in your uh, in your image you may apply a different filter mask and this kind of normalized convolution you can no longer just apply in frequency domain because you have spatially varying kernels but you can very efficiently suppress outliers so you get uh, if you're smoothing anyway you can smooth away the outliers very efficiently but unfortunately uh, you cannot implement it in uh, uh, in the frequency domain anymore so you rather use smaller kernels for this one here but it's it can be implemented very efficiently and it very nicely removes the outliers as you've seen previously good um, then I think this is already enough because we don't manage to go through the bilateral filter anymore and we will continue with the bilateral filter in the next lecture so please attend next lecture because the bilateral filtering is is uh, is a very interesting method it's uh, very easy to follow it's very easy to implement but and it delivers really beautiful images so you can see that uh, also in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, commercial uh, advertisements you use bilateral filtering for example to uh, to actually enhance the the skin um, the skin quality and so on. So you can do virtual makeups with bilateral filters. So it's it's used a lot uh, also for marketing images and so on. So you can create really beautiful images with it. And we will do that in the next lecture. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. Any questions? No questions? Then see you next week. <laughs>